Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on the Public Order Act 2023. Um, the aim of it is to examine and discuss the new offences and what they mean for activists in the state, the law and protest and free speech in the UK today. My name is Russell Fraser. I'm a barrister at Garden Court Chambers. Uh, specialising in criminal defence, and I will be chairing this evening. But before I introduce the other speakers who you'll be hearing from tonight, I'm afraid I do have some housekeeping that I'm uh, beholden to go through. The, I must tell you that the webinar is being recorded. We will send out the slides in the recording link to everyone who has registered to attend in due course. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Um, if you would like to insert some questions in there during the course of the talks, then please do, and we'll try and deal with some of them at the end, time permitting. Uh, we're hoping we will wrap up things by 7pm. And I'm also advised to let you know about two refugee uh, week events happening next week that Chambers is organising. That's on the 20th and the 21st of June, with online spaces available and a follow-up session on the 29th of June with the in-person and online spaces still available also. And the links, I believe, will appear in the chat. So I will say a few things about the uh, some of the main new offences and some of the background to how the Act came about. Uh, my colleague, Will Hansen, you'll hear from on Stop and Search followed by Laura O'Brien on the serious disruption prevention orders. And lastly, Kevin Blue on the task for activists and campaigners going forward. But on, and I'll say a bit more about each of them uh, in due course. The Public Order Bill, you will know, was introduced last year and, it, and it's, it, it stated that there were three main purposes to it. First, to, to expand protest-related offences Secondly, to extend police stop and search powers. And thirdly, to introduce a new preventative court order. The, the government, of course, claimed to be responding to a number of high profile protests, which they said caused serious disruption in recent years. And claimed, of, of course, a familiar refrain that police had insufficient powers to deal with mass participation, non-violent protests. We, we've had in 2022, of course, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, that gave the police greater powers to deal with protest at the time. And during the course of the, the passage of that bill, which became the Act, the government uh, tabled a number of late amendments, which are now largely reflected in the Public Order Act itself. They had been previously rejected at the Lord stage of the PCSC bill, um, and when this new bill came about, which became the Act, it was welcomed, of course, by the usual suspects, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue said that it was necessary because there had to be a modest reset of the scales between the rights of protesters and the rights of, of others. Again, a familiar refrain and, and the rebalancing always, in our view, goes that bit too far. That organisation had in fact published a report in 2021 making a number of recommendations which ended up in the Police Crime Sentencing Courts Act. Other groups such as Liberty called the bill a staggering assault on our right to protest as well as an attack on our other fundamental rights. Greenpeace said the right to protest is one of the safety valves of our democracy. It allows ordinary people to protect their health, families and homes from harm when all other safeguards have failed. The government's attempt to criminalize peaceful dissent is a threat to everyone's right to stand up for what they believe in. And even Max Hill, the director of public prosecutions said that in his view, the prosecuting authorities had the legal tools they needed to bring cases before the courts and ain't that the truth. So to begin, if I may, that the, the Act is split into three parts. Part one deals with these pub, new public order offences. The second part is about the serious disruption prevention orders. And part three is, is simply a short general section, which includes uh, the meaning of serious disruption, of which you'll hear a bit more in 
due course. The main offences in part one in which we are interested come under three headings. Offences relating to locking on, offences concerning tunnelling, and offences concerning uh, works, large works and infrastructure. Now, the locking on offences, they are in force. They were brought in before the coronation, as was widely reported. A statutory instrument was laid after the Act itself came into force, ensuring that those measures would be available to officers in advance of the, the coronation. Section 1 of the Act is an offence for a person to attach themselves to another person, to an object or to land, or to attach a person to another person, to an object or to land, or attach an object to another object or to land. And that act is or, cap or is capable of causing serious disruption to two or more individuals or an organization in a place other than a dwelling. And they intend to act, they intend that act to have a consequence mentioned in paragraph B above, or they are reckless as to whether it will have such a consequence. Now, serious disruption, as I said, is defined in section 34 of the Public Order Act. I'm just going to turn it up for our purposes. That says, of course, that for the purposes of this act, the cases which in which individuals or an organisation may suffer serious disruption include, in particular, where the individuals or the organization are by way of physical obstruction prevented or hindered to more than a minor degree from carrying out their day-to-day -day activities, construction or maintenance works or activities related to such works, B, are prevented from making or receiving or suffer a delay that is more than minor to the making or receiving of a delivery or a time-sensitive product or C, are prevented from accessing or suffer a disruption that is more than minor to the accessing of any essential goods or any essential service. So, in due course, no doubt, uh, courts will have to consider the question of what more than a minor degree means, and it basically would appear to be on the face of it mean any disruption at all um, and it lowers the threshold for criminality and allows the police on the face of it to make arbitrary decisions at different times about how to intervene and when to seek to arrest people who are carrying out non-violent direct action. You may think it somewhat subverts the meaning of serious disruption to only require as few as two people to, to be affected in the first instance and also to only require that it is capable of causing serious disruption. How on earth is that to be determined? The Act does provide a reasonable excuse defence and the maximum penalty, uh, as far as imprisonment is concerned, is six months. Section two, it, it largely reflects much of the wording, save it, it, it concerns someone who might be considered to be equipped for locking on. A person commits an offence if they have an object with them in a place other than dwelling, with the intention that it may be used in the course of or in connection with the commission of any of by any person of an offence under section one and that offence is fine only now these tactics as we all know are not particularly new and it hasn't prevented plenty of people being arrested and prosecuted in the past but typically for offences such as obstruction of the highway or increasingly public nuisance the police and the government have said during the course of the, the passage of the bill that became the Act that, of course, there are now more complex methods being used by activists and protesters and that it consequently causes a greater drain on resources. But it, that, of course, has nothing to do with whether the existing powers and the existing law is sufficient for their purposes. The threshold under the, these offences, plainly, the threshold for criminality is lower. It simply has to be capable of causing serious disruption and, and, and conceivably could criminalise a vast range of activities and constrain uh, the manner and form in which people seek to um, vindicate their Article 10 and 11 rights. Now, these sections, as I said, were enforced before the coronation, and we know 
that we saw in the in the in the run up that the arrest of six protesters in particular who were apparently suspected of being equipped for locking on and the Met then issued a statement saying it regretted that those six people arrested were unable to join the wider group of protesters but of course by that point it, it's too late um, people who were on the face of it not even intending to use the equipment that they had with them for the purpose alleged um, were unable to take part and by that point expressions of regret are all well and good but um, there's been a serious infringement with a person's right to protest. Offences relating to tunnelling as I mentioned are governed by section 3. Now this isn't yet in force um, plainly it has in mind the sorts of um, actions that are carried out by groups such as Just Stop Oil, where we've seen tunnelling under the roads and the access roads uh, leading to oil refineries and the like. A person commits an offence if they create or participate in the creation of a tunnel. The creation or existence of the tunnel causes or is capable of causing serious disruption, again, to two or more individuals or an organisation in a place other than a dwelling, and they intend the creation or existence of the tunnel to have a consequence mentioned in B, and we know that's to do with a serious disruption or as reckless as to whether it takes place. Again, there is a reasonable excuse to defence as part of the statute. Um, six months in the magistrate's court, but three years um, maximum in the Crown Court. Again, section four, not yet in force, but it applies to anyone who is present in a relevant tunnel having entered it after the coming into force of this section, their presence in the tunnel causes or is again capable of causing serious disruption to two or more individuals or an organisation. And again, section five, the penalties are the same, the reasonable excuse defence is also there. Section five, not yet in force, a person commits an offence if they have an object with them in a place other than a dwelling with the intention that it may be used in the course of or in connection with the commission by any person of an offence under the previous two sections. Six months imprisonment, as I say, the maximum for that latter offence. Section six, that concerns the obstruction of major transport works, that is not yet in force, and it criminalises behaviour that obstructs or interferes with the construction or maintenance of transport works. One can, one can readily bring to mind things like HS2, must be what was had in mind. The offence is committed if a person obstructs the undertaker or a person acting under the authority of the undertaker from carrying out construction or maintenance of major transport works or interferes with, moves or removes any apparatus relating to the construction or maintaining major transport works, uh, six months maximum. Again, we see here extremely broad drafting, no assistance with what is meant by apparatus. Could it, in, could it include, for example, interfering with some high-vis vests or safety helmets? The word isn't defined. And to be guilty of this offence, it does not appear that one needs to have any destructive or disruptive intention. Section seven, is in force and that concerns the use or operation um, interference with the use or operation of key national infrastructure the offense is committed if a person does an act which interferes with the use or operation of key national infrastructure in england and wales and that intend that act to interfere with the use or operation of such infrastructure or are reckless as to whether it will do so now, section 7.6 sets out some examples of what is to be considered to be a key national infrastructure. Again, just turning it up to give some examples. We have things that might more readily spring to mind, such as the road transport infrastructure and the rail infrastructure, but then we start to see things like downstream oil infrastructure, gas infrastructure, electricity generation infrastructure and newspaper printing uh, infrastructure. It, it, it strikes me that um, in some instances, one could question whether these are truly things that can be described as national infrastructure, but it's plainly 
targeted at the protests that we saw a couple of years ago, um, which prevented some national newspapers being printed, and uh, whether, for example, printing presses, are they truly key national infrastructure in this day and age when most news is distributed uh, on the internet and other means? Again, this has the defence of reasonable excuse um, or a defence of the uh, the action being in furtherance of a trade dispute, the maximum penalty being 12 months imprisonment on indictment. Again, a question that springs to mind is to what degree would an interference have to reach before it becomes criminal? It, it seems that perhaps very little at all. So I hope, appreciate that was a bit of a whistle stop tour through the opening offences. We'll come back to them, I'm sure, in due course. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Will Hansen. Uh, Will became a tenant at Gar Garden Court in November 2022. Following the successful completion of his pupillage, he is developing a broad criminal defence practice with experience in general crime, financial crime, extradition, and, and plainly uh, protest. He's a particular interest in offences concerning human rights issues, modern slavery, public order and process, and is fresh from uh, securing an acquittal just last week in for a Black Lives Matter activist. Take it away, Will. Thank you very much, Russell. And thank you to everyone who has attended this webinar on such a nice summer's afternoon. Uh, it's a real dedication on your part. I'm going to talk through the new stop and search powers that have been introduced under the 2023 Act. And I'll spend some time going through the relevant provisions before considering some of the implications of these powers for protest and protesters. I should note at the outset that while the Act received royal assent on the 2nd of May this year, and a number of provisions were rushed into force by a statutory instrument on the 3rd of May, um, ahead of the King's coronation, these stop and search powers are not yet in force, so their application by the police remains to be seen. What I think can be said, however, at this stage, is that this Act gives breathtakingly extensive powers to the police which has concerning implications for the future of peaceful and democratic protest. I'm just going to try and share my screen. I hope everyone can see that. So the relevant provisions are found principally in sections 10 to 14 of the new act relating to the stop and search powers um, conferred on the police. Section 10, and this is oh. Section 10 um, confers powers to stop and search on suspicion. Uh, it amends section one of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984 to allow a constable to stop and search a person or vehicle if they have reasonable grounds for suspecting that they will find an article made or adapted or intended for use in the course of or in connection with the following offences which are listed in the Act. And these are the classic protest offences of willful obstruction of a highway and public nuisance, as well as the new offences that Russell's already referred to, um, which are contained in the Act, locking on, causing serious disruption by tunnelling or being present in a tunnel, obstruction of major transport works and interference with the use or operation of key national infrastructure. So essentially what section 10 does uh, is it extends suspicion led so stop and search powers to a range of protests related offences. The really concerning provision in this act in relation to stop and search however is section 11 and in my view, this marks possibly the most controversial part of the new act um, because it confers incredibly broad and intrusive powers of stop and search on the police uh, when they attend and police protests. So section 11 provides 
that an inspector or a more senior officer can authorise a uniformed police officer to undertake suspicionless stop and searches in a particular location for a specified period when the senior officer reasonably believes the following. And the first thing is that the offences listed in section 111A may be committed. And again, these are the um, classic protest offences already referred to in section 10. Um, but also, if the senior officer reasonably believes that persons are carrying prohibited objects in any locality within the officer's police area. Now, a prohibited object is defined in the Act as an object which is made or adapted for use in the course of or in connection with an offence or is intended by the person having it with them for such use by them or by some other person. And you'll note perhaps at this point how incredibly vague the phrase made or adapted for use in the course of or in connection with an offence is um, and how widely that could be construed by a police officer uh, intending to apply these powers. But I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail when I've been through these provisions. There's a set of necessity provisions under section 11.4. So police officer must reasonably believe that the authorization is necessary to prevent people committing uh, the listed offences or carrying prohibited objects. The specified locality must be no greater than is necessary to prevent such activity. And the specified period should be no longer than is necessary to prevent such an activity. Authorizations of these powers can be for a period not exceeding 24 hours, but they may be extended if they continue to be considered necessary uh, for a further 24 hours. Further, section 11.6 gives the power to any constable in uniform to stop and search someone um, or anything carried by them for a prohibited object and to stop and search a vehicle and its driver and any passenger for a prohibited object. This can be done whether or not the constable has any grounds for suspecting that the person or vehicle is carrying uh, the said prohibited object. And uh, if, if reasonable grounds uh, are found for suspecting it is prohibited object, then the officer can seize it. I'll briefly go through the formalities uh, required when it comes to and giving such an authorization for these suspicionless stop and search powers. If an inspector gives an authorization under Section 11, he must, as soon as it is practical to do so, cause an officer of above the rank of superintendent to be informed. Any authorization must be in writing, signed by the officer giving it, specify the grounds on which it's given, specify the locality in which and the period during which these powers are exercisable. Um, and, that, and that also applies for a direction to continue any authorization beyond the 24 hour period. Uh, that must also be given in writing as soon as it is practical to do so. Section 13 provides that any person who is searched or the driver of a vehicle that is stopped under Section 11 is entitled to obtain a written statement that they were searched under Section 11 powers if they apply for the statement within the period of 12 months. And to round it all off, section 14 creates an offence relating to section 11, whereby if a person commits an offence, so if a person intentionally obstructs a constable in the exercise of the constable's powers, then they can be liable for imprisonment of a term not exceeding 51 weeks or fine or both. So what are the implications uh, of section 11, which is the most uh, dramatic introduction of new police powers in the Act? Well, firstly, uh, many people here on this webinar has probably noticed that there are, there's a correlation between uh, these stop and search powers and 
the Section 60 searches under um, the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994. And under Section 60, searches can be authorised if an officer reasonably believes that serious violence may take place in any locality. And so what appears to have been done here is there's been an equation of peaceful and sometimes disruptive protests with violence. It's also, it's also notable that there are in fact very few instances in which our parliament has decided that such suspicionless stop and search powers, controversial as they are, are necessary for the protection of the public. And these concern terrorism, or in the case of Section 60, serious crime. And remarkably, those powers have now been extended to the realm of protest. So this gives you a sense of how draconian this legislation and these powers really are. These powers are vague and widely defined, and this ris risks police overreach and the deterrence of peaceful and lawful protest. And you'll recall at clause 11.2 that it will allow the police to search an individual where they have reasonable grounds for finding an article that is made or adapted for use in the course of or in connection with one of the relevant offences. Well, this could arguably be a huge range of things. People carrying bike locks and chains or tools for their bikes, which are of course very common in London. Many people attend protests on their bikes. People who have plastic cable ties, super glue or gaffer tape. A mobile phone call for friends also attending a procession or assembly. Someone going to photograph a protest where there is locking on. These could all be captured potentially, and there's no further effort within legislation to define um, that very widely construed provision. And the sheer vagueness and breadth of this legislation could clearly capture a wide range of perfectly peaceful, well-intentioned individuals uh, who are exercising their rights to protest within a democracy. And this, of course, risks a chilling effect on protest. Because a well-meaning person could reasonably expect on the, on the basis of this legislation to be stopped and searched by the police simply for participating in a protest. And they could fear potential arrest and charge um, if otherwise perfectly common and innocuous items are deemed to be prohibited items. Potential for discriminatory application. Well, the discriminatory use of stop and search powers against ethnic minority commun communities is well documented. Uh, the Section 60 suspicionless searches have been found especially ineffective and discriminatory in their application. Section 60 powers are primarily used in deprived areas, which often have a higher population of black people. A mere 4% of stops result in arrest of black people are more than 20 times likely to be searched than white people under suspicionless stop and search powers. Now, while the focus of this legislation appears very much to be around the climate protests, Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop Oil, Insulate Britain and the, the tactics that they can employ, um, it of course applies to any protest and we don't need to look too far back to the anti-racist movement, the Black Lives Matter protests, and you wonder how these stop and search powers, given the way that they are already applied to minority communities, will be wielded should those protests arise and the police uh, decide to use these powers. And that, of course, fosters mistrust and over-criminalization. These powers are likely to build on the foundation of mistrust amongst ethnic minority communities. But I'd also expect the public more generally, given the recent controversies attaching to the Metropolitan Police Force in particular. And the issue here is really that these powers encourage aggressive policing. 
they can more or less search anyone in the area in case they hold a prohibited object. People are understandably going to be questioning of the police when they appear to be stopped to search for absolutely no reason at all. And one of the concerns with that is it risks engaging arrest and prosecution uh, under the new powers, uh, of, uh, under the new offence of under Clause 14, if the police consider that an individual is intentionally obstructing the constable in the exercise of his powers. So all in all, these are very concerning new powers given to the police, often reserved simply for the most serious situations, such as serious violence and terrorism. And it remains to be seen how they're going to be applied and how judicious the police will be in their um, wielding of these powers. And inevitably there will be potential for litigation and there are concerns about whether these powers can be considered compatible with convention rights, namely Articles 10 and 11, but possibly Article 8 as well. And can suspicionless interference with otherwise peaceful protests be a proportionate means of achieving legitimate aim? There's also an interesting question possibly around whether these stop and search powers can be applied in a discriminatory fashion under the Equality Act 2010, because if the police accept that a significant influence for their stop and search of a protester is their political opinion, take anti-racism as an example, um, then that could be considered unlawful by reference to uh, the Equality Act 2010 and necessarily Article 14 of the Convention. Um, but uh, as I said, it all remains to be seen at the moment how uh, the police are going to deal with these new powers and whether they're going to, in practice, use them as they are able to. Thank you. That's, that's all I've got to say on stop and search. But thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Will. Our next speaker is <coughs> Laura O'Brien, a partner at Hodge Williams and Allen. She is a dedicated defence solicitor and crime court advocate with a diverse caseload with a particular interest in representing children and young adults. Um, she's been described by clients as extremely passionate, knowledgeable and professional. Laura has represented Extinction Rebellion protests, those who were acquitted of breaching a Section 14 condition on assembly, one of the many acquittals secured in relation to prosecutions arising from the April 2019 Extinction Rebellion protests. I'll, I'll hand over to Laura. Thank you, Russell. Let me just try and uh, hopefully share my slides. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So um, I will be covering the serious disruption prevention orders. Um, I am mindful of the time and I have a lot of slides, a lot more uh, than I had anticipated. I'm going to try and not focus too much um, on the statutory provisions because they're contained within the slides and try and save some time to touch on the practical considerations. Um, the important thing is that the um, sections that deal with serious disruption prevention orders are not yet in force and can only be brought into force by regulations created by statutory instrument. We were having a discussion before this started about when we guess they'll be brought into force. Um, there is provision within the legislation for um, guidelines to be issued essentially to the police and, and they would need to be debated in Parliament. So um, I, I think it could be a little while, but watch this space. Um, the, the general focus of serious disruption prevention orders is the prevention of protest related offences and protest related breaches of injunction. Laura, sorry to interrupt. Are, yeah. you, are your slides supposed to be up right now or not? Uh, yes. Can you not see them? There we go. Can we see that? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, Laura. Yeah, All right, Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. So, um, what is a serious disruption prevention order? Um, it is an order imposed for the following purposes. So, to prevent P, um, protester, from committing a protest related offence or a protest related breach of an injunction or carrying out um, activities that um, 
activities related to a protest that result in or are likely to result in serious disruption to two or more individuals or to an organization in England and Wales or to prevent BP from causing or contributing to the commission by another person or of such offenses or breaches of injunction or carrying out activities as described above. Um, to protect two or more individuals or an organization in England and Wales from the risk of serious disruption arising from a protest related offence, a protest related breach of injunction or activities related to a protest. You get the general flavour of it from there. Um, there are two circumstances in which an application can be made. The first is on, con on, con on conviction and the second is on um, application by way of complaint. Um, so section 20 deals with applications um, on conviction. Um, what I would say is it's not a terribly drafted bit of legislation. If you are dealing with one of these applications, uh, the best thing to do is to really go back to the legislation and, and follow it through. Um, but the, the criteria here for um, an application on conviction, so it applies to someone who is 18 or over, who is convicted of an offence, um, which was committed on or after the day in which the section comes into force. So any offences committed now or in the next couple of weeks before this, this section comes into force um, won't give rise to, to any such application. And then uh, the prosecution applies for a serious disruption prevention order to be made in respect of P. So not uh, on application by the court alone. Um, the court... Or sorry again to interrupt. Um, I think you're still stuck on the title slide as the comments, which oh, are... Oh, forgive me. I'm not sure. Right, bear with me. Let me stop sharing. Um, how many lawyers does it take to uh, share um, a slide? Here we go. Can you see that? Yes, it's, you're able to shift slides then. It says SDPO on conviction. Yeah, that's the one. The court dealing with P in respect to the current offence may make a serious disruption prevention order in respect of P if the court is satisfied on the balance of probabilities um, that the current offence is a protest related offence, uh, that the conditions set out in three is met and the court considers it necessary to make the order for the purpose mentioned in subsection five. Um, now, I, I will come on later to comparisons um, between um, criminal behaviour orders and the serious disruption prevention orders, largely because some of the case law that deals with criminal behaviour orders is likely to be helpful in relation to uh, any applications for serious disruption prevention orders. But significantly, the difference between these orders and uh, criminal behaviour orders is the test in criminal behaviour orders is that it would help in relation to serious disruption prevention orders it is that it is necessary. Uh, and that is a higher test and an important test to bear in mind. And, and, and no doubt, um, one of the things reflecting the considerations about the interferences with, with the right to protest. Um, there are important things in terms of the time frame here. So um, within the relevant period, P has committed another protest related offence for which P was convicted or has committed a protest related breach of an injunction for which P was found in contempt of court. And the current offence and P's contact, conduct mentioned in paragraph A relate to different protests or took place on different days and um, the conduct has not been taken into account when making any previous serious disruption prevention order. Now, an crucial part here is that it's not just the commission of an offence, but it's the commission of an offence where P was convicted. So um, a caution wouldn't apply, having been charged and the matter to be discontinued wouldn't apply, they would have to be convicted of it. Likewise, having breached an injunction is not sufficient. It's breach of an injunction where they were found in contempt of court. And I'll come on to why that might have practical considerations later on down the line. Still on um, slide four, Laura. Sorry. Yeah, I'm still dealing with the, the end of slide four. So um, in terms of the period of five years, so it says on or after the period of five years on or after the day on which the section comes in force and at a time when P was age 16 or over. So um, at the moment, any new arrests, we don't need to worry about them giving rise to um, serious disruption prevention orders 
but as soon as this section comes into force, we need to be mindful of the impact. Um, I won't deal with what is serious disruption because Russell has touched on it, but it is produced here for the slides, which can be distributed afterwards. Um, I'm now on slide six, if everyone's following, that is a serious disruption prevention order on application. Um, now, the, the circumstances are very, very similar, so I'm not going to repeat them here. But in, importantly, there is a list of people who have the power to make an application to the magistrate's court by way of complaint. Um, so that means if an application hasn't been made at the point that someone is convicted, but the police essentially want to go back and make the application, there is the power to do so. And so relevant chief officer of police, chief constable of the British Transport uh, Police Force, um, including the Civil Nuclear Constabulary or the Ministry of Defence Police. So they're trying to expand the powers as far as possible. Um, the making of the order. Now, this is similar to the provisions for criminal behaviour orders in terms of the admissibility of evidence. So the evidence that can be relied upon in relation to the application, it does not matter whether the evidence would have been admissible in the proceedings for the current offence. Um, the court may adjourn any proceedings on an application for a serious disruption prevention order even after P has been sentenced. So you may have um, uh, service of an application, but someone is then sentenced at the hearing and it's adjourned for the, the, the order itself um, to be determined or the application to be determined. Um, I, I would generally say, as with criminal behaviour orders, um, even, and it's going to be very unlikely, uh, clients, defendants don't take particular issue with the application, I would not waive it through uh, upon conviction and sentence. I would be setting it down for proper presentation of the evidence and time to take instructions and consider the material. Um, because in terms of what is necessary, it's not just a question of whether the order itself is necessary, but whether each individual um, requirement or prohibition that is being sought is necessary. And um, what the case law, which I will re refer to at the end of the slides, makes clear is, is that it turns on its own facts. So you need to have an incredibly detailed understanding of the history of your client, including um, or, or anyone who's been su made subject of this, I'm posing this towards defence practitioners, including any offences which may not um, give rise to the provisions but could still be part of the historic background um, of their personal circumstances of the implications of any of the prohibitions or requirements. Um, now I'm quite keen to not lose time um, in relation to the practical considerations um, but in terms of what the order can can include it can include um, requirements so positive requirements and prohibitions um, now, looking at the wording of this legislation, it's clear that, that they've tried to include and, and have a nod to some of the considerations that have come into similar previous um, behaviour orders um, and legislation and case law that's dealt with, with the requirements. Crucially here at the bottom, and this is evidencing why you need to have the full details of the person who's to be made subject to the order, the requirements or prohibitions of which are imposed on a person by serious disruption prevention order must, so far as practicable, practicable be such as to provide any conflict with the person's religious beliefs and any interference with the times, if any, at which the person normally works or attends any educational establishment. So you really, really need to have that detail and that information and ideally evidence. Um, the order must state the reasons for making the order incredibly important and that reflects some earlier case law and penalties which, which may be imposed for breaching the order. Um, there also needs, if there are re positive requirements, specification of the person or organization who is to be responsible for supervising compliance. And in fact, before any positive requirement is imposed, there needs to be evidence about suitability and enforceability from that person. That can be a person or organization. Um, now, this, I think, is an aspect of these orders which causes me most concern. Um, as part of um, a, sex, a serious disruption prevention order, there must be notification requirements. Notification requirements as you have under the Sexual Offences Act. And it's it's alarming to think such a provision is being introduced in relation to protest. 
um, but where an order is made, there must then be notification requirements. And that includes within three days of order taking effect, not, not it being um, imposed, but it taking effect, um, provision of name or any names used, home address and any addresses which P regularly resides at or stays, and then within three days notification of any new or further names or um, home addresses or any new uh, addresses where they will stay. And um, notification where a decision is made to stay away at a different address for one month or more. Um, that is incredibly intrusive um, and very, very alarming. Um, notification can be satisfied by attendance at the police station or oral notification to a police officer or to any person authorised for the purpose by the officer in charge of the station. Now, for anyone who might be made subject to such an order, I would never do it orally. Um, if given that failure to comply with the not notification requirements, as well as um, positive requirements and prohibitions, could give rise to a criminal offence, you want to make sure that you have a record. Um, so I would, um, yes, provide oral notification, but make sure that that is evidenced in writing, that an email is sent to follow up, that you are given a receipt, because um, we all know how um, ineffective police stations can be at keeping a record of information. Um, duration. So importantly here, not less than one week and not more than two years. There are provisions for when the order is to take effect. So similarly to other types of prohibitive orders, um, there is the, the ability to sus essentially suspend the beginning of the order if someone is in custody or subject to a custodial sentence. Um, sorry, forgive me, subject to license. Um, sorry, it's in custody, on license. Um, and it can be suspended until they're released from custody um, or they're no longer uh, subject to license or they're no longer on remand. Um, if a further order is imposed, then any previous order ceases to take effect. Now, I'm conscious of the time, um, but in relation to breaches, um, importantly, the maximum sentence is the maximum punishable for summary offences. So that is um, uh, at uh, we, we know that the provisions are swinging between uh, 51 weeks and six months. Now, um, importantly here, um, there are cases that relate to criminal behaviour orders, which may well have relevance um, when dealing with these types of applications. There, there is likely to be statutory guidance. Um, the legislation doesn't say they have to issue statutory guidance, but that there is the power to, and that that would have to be published. I think it's almost inevitable that there will be statutory guidance, uh, and that is likely to tie together a lot of these principles. But these cases, nevertheless, are likely to hold relevance. Um, there is um, important um, comments here about the fact that this should not just be a tick boxing exercise that despite the fact that there's no um, not a criminal burden of proof is nevertheless something that requires careful consideration uh, and there should be caution exercise in imposing such orders. Um, there is also considerations about whether or not the person who's being made subject to the order is capable of complying with it and if they're not capable of complying with it then it, it shouldn't be imposed. Uh, just, a, just a point here because the criminal behaviour orders, the test was whether it would help uh, preventing criminal behaviour. The test here is necessary and it should be only so far as necessary. So there is a proportionality assessment in here um, inevitably. Really, that's about the circumstances of the case. You would need to understand all of the offences, all of the breaches of injunctions that may have occurred before the section comes into place, anything that has happened since, I would suggest a detailed chronology, including the date, the, um, the date that the section came into force when other things have happened. But you also need to think about what was the degree of disruption involved in any of the previous incidents that give rise to the order uh, being imposed. Um, I'm conscious that I'm running out, um, over time, so I'll just finish with the final points. Um, now, given that these have not been um, put into place as of yet, we haven't yet had the follow on amendments to other legislation. It's very likely that there would be legal aid for these order, uh, orders as prescribed proceedings. It's also very unlikely, and I, I find this particularly worrying and often uh, forgotten, that as with other post-conviction other post um, orders, it's likely to have an impact 
on how long it takes for a conviction to be spent. So at the moment, for example, if you have a restraining order, even if you get a conditional discharge, um, it is when the the restraining order finishes that the is the um, earliest point at which the, the the conviction could be considered spent, and that could make a significant difference. Um, I think careful consideration needs to be given to what outcomes there are in criminal cases and contempt proceedings. You can see absolutely the importance here of making representations that prosecution or committal proceedings are not in the public interest to try and avoid a situation where, where these powers can be exercised. Um, but let's watch this space because these aren't yet enforced and we will see what the statutory guidance says and we need, we'll need may well need to reflect on the practical approach once we know what the guidance is. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Of course, no online seminar is complete without technical difficulties, so thanks for persevering. Um, our next uh, speaker is Kevin Blue, Campaign Coordinator at the Network for Police Monitoring. Uh, in his role as campaigns coordinator, he, he brings together many of the UK's most experienced campaigners, lawyers and researchers to highlight and challenge public order policing that violates rights to freedom of assembly. And he's been doing this sort of work, I think it's fair to summarise, for the best part of 25 years. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Russell. Um... And thanks to all the previous speakers for explaining so comprehensively what's in the um, in the, the new Public Order Act. What I want to do is to try and explain why this is happening now and what we can do about it. So I'm guessing there's a starting point that everybody here uh, knows the disruptive protests, direct action, civil dis disobedience tactics have not suddenly appeared out of nowhere in the last few years. I certainly spent um, five years uh, at fracking protests around the country where local people were slow walking, they were sitting in the road, they were locking on, and where the police were using what were already extensive powers to arrest people and charge them. So what's changed? Um, I think there are two critical turning points that led to the emergence of recent anti-protest laws. Um, and some of this has been touched on by others. The, the, the first is definitely the emergence of Extinction Rebellion um, and its strategy of using disruption and arrest to try and rapidly shake up the inertia of public debate on the climate crisis. And in particular, two events that Exxon organised in London in 2019. The first was the huge series of protests in April of that year that led to um, really stinging criticisms of the Metropolitan Police from the right and from the media, which has to be said, senior officers took very, very badly indeed. And then there was the subsequent crackdown that followed in October 2019, uh, when the Met um, was found to have acted unlawfully by treating every protest action as a single demonstration and effectively opposing a London-wide ban on Extinction Rebellion. Um, and NetPol covers that particular protest in some detail in our report, Restricting Re the Rebellion, which you can find on our website. Now, in between those two, um, those two major uh, activities by XR, uh, the police and the Home Office held a protest roundtable in June of 2019, which was intended to, quote, explore the most effective legislative options that would assist in policing protests more effectively. And much of what eventually became the protest elements of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act in 2022, and now the Public Order Act, emerged from proposals that were tabled at that meeting. Um, one of the proposals that was discussed and as has been outlined, is possibly one of the most draconian elements of the Public Order Act, which is the Serious Disruption Prevention Orders, was in fact rejected by the Home Office at that event because, quotes, it was very likely to lead to a legal challenge and it was unlikely that the measure would work as hoped. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Obviously, the other seismic event 
from that period was, of course, the election of the populist far right Johnson government in December 2019, a government that has no recognition whatsoever that the right to protest it has inherent value in a supposedly democratic society, um, a government with close links to climate change denial think tanks and ministers who um, have sought to aggressively frame political debate over the consequences of inaction over the climate emergency into a culture, a culture war. One between disruptive environmentalists on one side and hardworking citizens going about their daily lives on the other, as though those two things were, were two entirely separate groups. Now, as you've heard, the government has sought to restrict the right to so-called disruptive protests in three ways. Firstly, by severely narrowing the idea of what is an acceptable disrupt what is acceptable disruption and bearing in mind that all protests cause some form of disruption to mean only the most minor hindrances are considered legitimate and by minor as we've seen over the last few weeks that means slowing traffic if it involves a group that's seen as disruptive uh, secondly uh, by expanding police powers to offer senior officers what they might potentially find useful at some point rather than what is genuinely reasonable or proportionate the usual standard for human rights compliance and thirdly by introducing the new laws that we've been talking about today to criminalize the methods by which serious disruption might potentially take place rather than focusing on the actual disruption that any individual protest could lead to so if you think about it, this is one leading to the next. So essentially, the new um, definition of disruption justifies the offences, which in turn justifies the new police powers. That was the thinking behind this. In many ways, the new offences that, um, that Russell outlined earlier are not themselves the most alarming part of the act. Um, as I said, police have always been able to, to act if somebody interfered with key national infrastructure or if they were and they were able to arrest people if they were locked on the difference is that these offensives have much tougher sentences on conviction um they provide a much easier excuse for um very very uh, strict and very stringent bail conditions um all of which has been presented by the government as necessary to counter this scary new threat to society serious disruption that requires tougher police tough of tougher new powers for the police uh these are as wills outlines the powers to stop and search anybody who, who is planning to act disruptively uh who might be sorry might be out planning to act disruptively and just confiscate items that may cause disruption in in some cases without the need for reasonable suspicion and what will probably be for restricted to a number of key organizers it essentially includes what is essentially the individual banning orders that Laura's described um now underpinning all of this is government pressure for a massive increase in intrusive police surveillance on political movements particularly when those serious disruption prevention orders come into force because intelligence is going to be the core of how uh, how evidence is gathered to try and bring those orders in and what the government has quite deliberately done with the public order act is um to try and make protesting seem more uncertain and seem more risky ministers know that few people are fortunate enough not to feel worried about the consequences and impacts of a sudden arbitrary arrest or of a, a prolonged court case or sustained surveillance on them or their families and so turning disruptive protests what you, you know what we should actually probably describe as effective protests into an activity that only a few are prepared to risk is intended to stop what Nepal argues is what is the thing that the state really fears which is direct action and civil disobedience becoming the tactics of a mass movement. So what can we do to resist this latest attack on our rights to protest? Everything that you've heard today has sounded particularly bleak, but 
now the public order is public order act has, has passed we've got work to do and although i know it feels that the what the because of what's happened that we that we are now living in a police state and as some people have said the protest is now illegal i really don't think that's a helpful argument at this point um the climate crisis other social and economic injustices they're not going away and we don't build mass movements by bolstering the idea the protests are banned and frightening people away from taking action we don't build movements by giving any ground to that kind of polarizing culture war argument that protesting against corporations and the state is a fringe activity this is exactly in our view what the government wants now of course um official systems of police accountability are hopeless uh but we know uh, and we certainly know from the collapse in trust in the police uh that will touched on earlier on in his outline around new stop and search powers that the police are not immune to public pressure over the, the abuse of their powers and that was certainly true with with Sarah Everard and uh and the aftermath of that we know that juries when given the opportunity and that's not always the case but when they are have been willing to equip people who've taken part in effective process involving uh disruptive tactics for the lawyers here, we know the Home Office was probably right to fear that serious disruption prevention orders are very likely to lead to a legal challenge. And when they are eventually introduced, we need to be ready for this. It's certainly an issue that I know members of the NetPol Lawyers Group, which in, in, involves um, many of the most experienced protest solicitors and barristers from around the country, will be sharing knowledge and strategies over um, during the coming year. Now, for the campaigners who are here, um, what we need to make sure is that we are better prepared to protect to protect the members of our movements. Firstly, by making sure that everybody knows their rights, because knowing what powers the police have gives people enormous confidence to challenge their misuse on the streets. And that's particularly true for stop and search, because stop and search is such a commonly used power. And that means making sure we are educating everybody on the new powers to stop and search for disruption, which, as Will said, is so open to abuse, but is also open to legal challenge. Uh, secondly, it means that we start to take the issue of police surveillance far more seriously, with a greater awareness of the basic security practices uh, that will help us to challenge um, police intelligence gathering. And also by recognizing that some people, particularly from racialized communities, are far more likely to be the targets of that surveillance. And thirdly, by getting much better at offering um, practical solidarity. So not seeing ourselves in isolation from other campaigns. That means understanding that the, the threat of oppressive policing falls on all of us. So we better start offering solidarity to each other even if we disagree with the tactics of a particular group um public order isn't just about isn't just a concern for um environmental campaigners uh they're not the only people that are going to face the prospect of the police deciding their process sort of serious disruption to the community it's also about um housing campaigners res resisting evictions those challenging um deportations uh, disability rights campaigners, those who are planning on, the, on going to the, um, the Dicey Arms Fair this September in East London. What solidarity also includes is a recognition, I think, that the, the Public Order Act uh, is an attack not just on the right to protest, um, but is, intri is intrinsically linked with government efforts to attack both the right to strike and the right to boycott. And that means we need to get better at combining our resistance to all three attacks on our human rights, which is something that NetPol is working uh, with War on Want on at the moment. And if you're a trade unionist, you need to be talking about bringing those three things together in your branch. Encourage members to join the dots, basically. And finally, we need to get better at actively monitoring what's happening around the country. 
Um, certainly for NetPol, that means that we need uh, to know when new powers are being used and in what circumstances, and in particular, outside of London, so in Wales and um, in the other other cities where there's protests taking place in England. Um, and certainly if you're in Scotland, making sure that you're in contact with uh, Scout as the organisation we work with there too. We need that information so we can build the evidence to show that these powers primarily exist to disrupt and further criminalise the right to dissent. They're not just about preventing serious disruption to the community and they therefore need to be challenged at every opportunity. And we urge you to, to get involved in that struggle. If you want to know more about how you can then and, and the information type of information that we need, um, then I'd urge you to have, take a look at our Defending Dissent page on a website and certainly think about offering um, NetPol the chance to speak to your organisation or at future events. I'll leave it there for any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin, and thanks for reminding everyone of the importance of remaining positive and the way in which different campaigns can come together to provide solidarity to one another, but also practical ways in which to uh, consider how to protest innovatively going forward. Um, we do have some time for questions. Um, I know it looks like questions have sort of um, been posted in the chat as well as the q and I'm going to focus on the q and um, Something that's cropped up a lot though across both, I think, is the is questions about the fatal motion which um, was uh, tabled in the, in the House of Lords and, and was defeated yesterday. It doesn't actually um, pertain to this piece of legislation. It's the, it's the Public Order Act 1986. Um, Kevin, it's fair to say it, it, it basically harmonises the, the level of disruption, doesn't it, across the two acts? It does. I mean, the, the power to be able to, to create these examples of what disruption might be was in the Police Crime Sensing of Courts Act originally. And I think people have indicated in the in the chat that the, the, the government has been particularly sneaky in, in attempting to, well, successfully uh, using... Um, particular examples that were rejected by the House of Lords during the passage of the legislation. But as I said, the intention here was to um, create a situation where there's only two kind of polarities, if you like, for protests. There's either minor disruption or there's serious disruption. And there's nothing in between. Um, and as we talked, we said, I mean, the, 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 the vote yesterday doesn't change that, doesn't change that intention. I mean, it, it attempted to try and stop the government from uh, using a statutory instrument. And I have to say that they're still not out of the woods. I know Liberty are planning on bringing a legal challenge and they've already sent um, uh, an action before claim letter. Um, we had some discussions with them about how NetPol may be able to assist in the future, depending on how that goes. But let's assume that that doesn't change. Um, the definition of serious disruption in any event is so broad that you need to be thinking about how it's used on the ground and so it's, there's a there's a kind of like academic legal debate about what this might mean and then there's the the cops on the streets making the decisions and yeah. we already have the case where pretty much stepping out into the road over the last 40 odd days if you're if you're a member of just stop oil means that you're causing serious disruption um, and I think that's the importance of making sure that we are monitoring what's going on and trying to build uh, a wider picture about, about how powers are used across the board. Obviously, the, we're talking with serious disruption about new powers, but um, as I've emphasised, it's not as though the police are not perfectly capable of essentially disrupting people's rights to protest anyway. Thanks, Kevin. Um... Does anyone else want to come in to come in on that, or I can move to another question? Um, in which case, uh, Laura, there's what someone's asked: Is there any case law relating to serious disruption prevention orders, e.g., e.g., behaviour order about nomadic people 
Um, for example, would someone who is nomadic be required to stay in the same place? I think you're on mute, sorry. Sorry, I'm doing it's incredibly well technically today. <laughs> apologies <laughs> and apologies for the slides. So um, the answer is I don't know without going back and having a look. I'd be interested to have a look. Um, but there are some helpful cases which I've included in the slides. Um, and one of them says that, where is it? Um, that they need to be uh, precise and capable of being understood, reasonable, proportionate, realistic, practical, clear and enforceable. And I think that that is, that is really important if you're talking about imposing on someone um, a way of life what the notification uh, parts of it. So I think one, one of the other questions in the chat is what can actually be imposed. There's, there's two parts to this. There are the positive requirements, the prohibitions, and then on top of that, the notifications. Um, in terms of the notification requirements, um, home address on that day, um, it's not clear, and I, I suspect it would be addressed in the statutory guidance, what happens if there is no home address. And I imagine that this is something that could give rise to a challenge because um, clearly if there is a home address, it needs to be notified. But if there is no home address, it cannot be notified. Would that be a breach? Um, there are examples of the prohibitions. So arguably, um, you could have a positive prohibition that you're to, um, sorry, a positive requirement to, you're, that you're to remain or to have a specific address. But that seems to me uh, vastly open to challenge, if you ask me, massive interference uh, with Article 8. Um, to come back on, on one of the other questions, then, the things that can be imposed. So aside from notification requirements, which relate to essentially names and addresses, um, the examples that are given include requirements to present themselves to a particular person at a particular place or between particular times on particular days. So if you had someone that didn't have a home address, you may find that that is the type of requirement they would seek to be able to, to have that intelligence and know where someone is or to remain at a particular place for particular periods. So again, that doesn't talk about a specifying um, uh, uh, a home address, but that does sound like essentially a, a non-electronically monitor, monitored um, live and sleep requirement. So we, we are getting very, very close to a requirement that someone remains at a specific place. Um, but, but, but going back to what I said before is that um, it's not just whether an order is imposed. You'd have to look at each proposed requirement and each proposed prohibition and be ready to make arguments in relation to each of those relevant to the specific person that's being made subject to it. And just briefly in terms of prohibitions, uh, pro prohibited from being at particular places or areas, including at specific times or days, or being with particular people, very concerning, uh, participating in particular activities, dangerously broad, having particular articles with them, or the one that concerns me is using the internet to facilitate or encourage persons to commit a, a protest related offence or a protest related breach of an injunction or carry out activities related to a protest that result in or are likely to result in serious disruption to two or more individuals. So um, I think that that is likely to be uh, a topic of much discussion. I would say it should be argued in any application uh, and considered as a basis for challenge, if anything, which does specify that someone has to, to, to be non-nomadic where they are previously nomadic, that that should be challenged and taken on appeal. Uh, Neil Pitt Kieran asks, in lock-on situations, I imagine that linking arms be interpreted as a form of attachment, what about holding hands? Are there degrees of attachment we can play around with? I think not surprisingly, um, again, during the passage of the bill, that example is one of the examples that uh, people raise, parliamentarians, campaigners and so on, say, well, linking arms it plainly would fall, you would think, within the definition of, of attaching oneself to another person. But then what does it mean to attach oneself? Does there have to be a degree of permanence and how you have gone about doing that or with, with, with some sort of um, discretion be shown by the police and that's the problem it relies too much as we see it on that kind of exercise of discretion and we know that often that is the ex discretion is not uh, exercised particularly judiciously. Um, I'm going to bring Will in 
is there any requirement on police to inform the public before the imposition of a section that allows suspicionless searching? No, no, is the answer. What the um, requirements are, as set out uh, at section 12 of the Act, is um, that an inspector who gives an authorization must, uh, as soon as it's practicable to do so, cause an officer of or above the rank of superintendent to be informed. Uh, and that must be done in writing, signed by the officer giving it, specifying the grounds on which it's given, the locality in which and the period during which the powers conferred by that section are exercisable. And of course, if a, a criminal allegation arose, then that would be liable to disclosure and, and whether um, I, the authorization was lawful can be interrogated. But this is not a situation like Section 14 of the 1986 Act, where conditions imposed on assemblies must be communicated to, to that assembly. Uh, you, would, you wouldn't know if you turned up to a protest. Um, whether suspicionless powers were in place. Thanks. Um, I should say someone has asked uh, how will the Public Order Act impact journalists covering protest events. Uh, there is a, another section that I didn't touch on uh, simply because of time and, and perhaps the, the offences that we consider people might be most interested. Again, it's section 17. Uh, it's not in force yet. Uh, it governs the exercise of police powers in relation to journalists. A uh, constable may not exercise a police power for the sole purpose of preventing a person from observing or reporting on a protest. Um, again, you'd think that sort of thing would have been obvious in, in previous instances. We know that there was a, I think it was, was it an LBC journalist who was arrested at a Just Stop Oil? Uh, demo or insulated Britain demo some time ago made it clear sh that she was a journalist. I, I believe had accreditation on her, but it made no difference whatsoever. Um, Evan, I don't know that. I know sometimes it's best to keep these things slightly more, um, shall we say, opaque. But there's a question about whether there's any any sort of fund that's being set up for for a legal challenge to any of this. You, you may be best placed to to know. Well, um. We've we've got a certain we've we've got a, a, some money that we've got from um, from donations and from a grant uh, to look at ways that we may be able to challenge this legally. I think one of the things is that it very much depends on how this legislation is rolled out. So, um, because in many cases there will be opportunity. If the if to give you an example, if the police decided to stop and search anybody. Who looked vaguely like a peace campaigner on the way on the way down to Dicey uh, in September, the arms fair in down the road from where I live, and which I've been, which would include me because I've been to every one of those since two thousand one. Um, I would have thought that the opportunity for a uh, for civil action on that would be very high, and that would be opportunities for for large numbers of people to do that. We're looking at something which is much more technical than we're looking at the situation with as with Liberty, where they're challenging the statutory instrument. They also have their own sources of funding. I don't think it's necessarily about just about funding, though. It's about the evidence. It's about building up the picture of what's happening in different places and that the way the police are using these powers and the potential contradictions between with between the way they use as well, because obviously, um, because they're so broad, they're going to get used in significantly different ways, not just in different parts of London, but different parts of the of the country. Um, but certainly we will be keeping an eye out on the on the potential opportunities for uh, for seeking some form of legal action on some of this stuff. And it, if it turns out to be wildly expensive, then the fighting fund is not a terrible idea, but not at the moment, no. Um, I've got a quick fire one for Will again. Do these search pairs include strip searching? Sorry, no, they don't. A short answer. A short answer to that one. Um, another question is presumably this would also capture trade union protests. Um, Laura, I think it's fair to say yes. 
definitely, albeit I suppose trade unions tend to be less involved in the sort of direct action protests that we're really this act is designed to uh, to capture. Yes, I mean the the that there is the question of how you determine a protest related offence or a protest related breach of an injunction. Um, and there is a kind of circular definition which it directly relates to a, to a protest. Um, of course, protest doesn't necessarily have a clear static definition. It's actually arguably quite a nebulous concept. And, and we talk about both articles 10 and 11 together, assembly, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, uh, forming that, that right to protest. But, but I think there is a, a, a dangerous risk that essentially um, by uh, being involved in something as a result of a, a designing to um, design to express your beliefs about something would be enough to be captured by this. Um, so I think that um, there is a real risk that this will extend beyond classic protest movements and affect um, trade union movements. That, that's my view anyway. Well, I would agree with that. Um, there have been, and, and to, to use the examples, I mean, obviously there is, there's the particular protections that are afforded by being on strike, and that's not the only time that trade unions are active. And certainly for some of the people that are um, parts of some of the small unions that are organising precarious workers, I'm thinking about people like United Voices of the World and others, um, quite often protests have formed part of their campaigns to try and seek rec recognition, and they have been subject, they're subject to uh, to restrictions on their ability to be able to take action at various places even before the public order act came in so i would be i, I would definitely feel that if it, if as trade unions become more active as campaigners then the potential for them to be caught up by this is is very likely um is, in fact is is probable and that's the part of the reason why i think it's so important that trade unions start to think about this much more I see it. It's it's not it's not far short of seven o'clock. I'm sure uh, on a warm summer's evening, uh, people won't uh, condemn me too harshly if I think that that's probably a, a good time at which to wrap things up. Um, thanks to everyone for attending this evening. Keep an eye on the Garden Court Chambers events uh, website for more um, events of this type, and uh, we hope to see you all soon in the future. And thanks very much to our speakers in particular our two guests uh, Kevin and Laura.